Today, I wanted to visit the classic works of Walter Lippmann's Public Opinion and Manufacturing Consent by Edward Herman and Noam Chomsky. Both works, I believe, are essential reading for those who wish to understand the process of consensus-making by an apparatus many on the dissident right call the cathedral, as the process to move public opinion and take what would seem to be radical ideas and slowly over time get the public to either agree or support these policies as the public good. If you haven't read either of these works, you should. Public Opinion is readily available online for viewing, and there are audiobook versions of Manufacturing Consent available on YouTube and other platforms. I will link them both in the description. Over the last several decades, progressive nightmares once deemed to be fear-mongering slippery slope argumentation from the right have manifested themselves into the public consensus of what is deemed acceptable. What we call the Overton Window can easily be framed by this consensus-making apparatus, and in the age of memes, a near-universal congruent opinion held by most journalists, what can start as something that we find to be laughably implausible is often the next hill worth dying on in the culture war. With that being said, considering that the title of Chomsky and Herman's work is directly pulled from Lippmann's book, let's start with public opinion. Lippmann's 1922 book is considered by many as an indictment of the lauded and commonly defended system of government that we know, at least nominally, as democracy. Lippmann argues that people live within their own respective pseudo-reality, and whatever fits their own biases and interests, that people, quote, live in the same world, but they think and feel in different ones, end quote. In addition to our own echo chambers, that the mechanism of the press, primarily news cables and newspapers of the time, leech off one another and don't actually do any real reporting except for the reporting on what other papers and journalists have already written down. He writes, quote, It is here that newspapers influence each other most deeply. Thus, when the war broke out, the American newspapers were confronted with a subject which they had no previous experience. Certain dailies, rich enough to pay cable tolls, took the lead in securing news, and in that way it was presented the model for the whole press. But where did that model come from? It came from the English press. Not because Northcliffe owned American newspapers, but because it was first easier to buy English correspondence, and because later it was easier for American journalists to read English newspapers than it was for them to read any others. London was the cable and news center, and it was there a certain technique for reporting the war was evolved. Something similar occurred when reporting of the Russian Revolution. In that instance, access to Russia was closed by military censorship, both Russian and Allied, and closed still more effectively by the difficulties of the Russian language. But above all, it was closed to the effective news reporting by the fact that the hardest thing to report is chaos, even though it is an evolving chaos. This put the formulating of Russian news at its source in Hellingsford, Stockholm, Geneva, Paris, and London into the hands of censors and propagandists." End quote. It is clear that not much has changed in nearly 100 years since this book was written. However, it is Littmann's proposed solutions to the crisis of a lacking understanding, reporting, and the inability for opinion of the public to be properly informed that brings us to the infamous term, manufacturing consent. Littmann writes, quote, the manufacture of consent is capable of great refinements, no one, I think, denies. The process by which public opinions arise is certainly no less intricate than it has appeared in these pages, and the opportunities for manipulation open to anyone who understands the process are plain enough. The creation of consent is not a new art. It is a very old one which was supposed to have died out with the appearance of democracy. But it has not died out. It has, in fact, improved enormously in technique because it is now based on analysis rather than the rule of thumb. And so, as a result of psychological research, coupled with the modern means of communication, the practice of democracy has turned a corner. A revolution is taking place, infinitely more significant than any shifting of economic power. Within the life of a generation now in control of affairs, persuasion has become a self-conscious art and a regular organ of popular government. None of us begins to understand the consequences, but it is no daring prophecy to say that the knowledge of how to create consent will alter every political calculation and modify every political premise. Under the impact of propaganda, not necessarily in the sinister meaning of the word alone, the old constraints of our thinking have become variables. It is no longer possible, for example, to believe in the original dogma of democracy, that the knowledge needed for the management of human affairs comes up spontaneously from the human heart. 
where we act on the theory that we expose ourselves to self-deception and to forms of persuasion that we cannot verify. It has been demonstrated that we cannot rely upon intuition, conscience, or the accidents of casual opinion if we are to deal with the world beyond our reach." End quote. Littman argues throughout the book that because the average man or woman does not have the capacity to be well-informed at all times, they will rely on those who are well-informed and have the capacity to collect and summarize data and have an opinion on the information according to them. He believed that a specialized class of bean counters would be necessary to help policymakers and the government leaders of the time inform the public of what needs to be done. A common sentiment amongst many of the time, especially in an age where technocracy was a popular idea amongst the academic and political class of its time. But if you know your James Burnham, then you know that this managerial information pushing class is exactly what came to be. Which brings us to Edward Herman and Noam Chomsky's 1988 work, Manufacturing Consent. But for the sake of today's video, I will be referencing my copy of the work which came out in 2008. Edwards and Chomsky developed in the book what is known as the Propaganda Model of Communication. The model can be summarized in five parts, or filters, in which the media generates public consent and consensus on a particular subject. While Chomsky and Edwards developed this theory to point out the media's bias on issues such as the War on Terror or anti-communism of the Cold War, we can see how this model is best applied to how decisions and narratives are made by the cathedral, and how things are set into motion. The model can be broken down on these points. 1. Profit motive in orientation and power. The dominant mass media outlets are largely profit-based operations, and therefore must cater to the financial interests of the owners such as corporation and controlling investors and financial interests. 2. Advertising license to do business. News media must therefore cater to the political prejudices and economic desires of their advertisers. This has weakened working class press. And for example, it helps maintain and explain the attrition of a large number of newspapers throughout the country. We've seen this especially as the new managerial class devours small, decentralized, and local institutions. 3. Sourcing Mass Media News Herman and Chomsky argue that the large bureaucracies of the powerful will subsidize the mass media and gain special access to the news, and by their contribution reducing the cost of acquiring and producing news, we can see how this relationship interacts. We see this all the time between various members of Democratic administrations and the media, as well as the infamous Brothers Cuomo of CNN and the Governor of New York. 4. Flack and the Enforcers Flack refers to the negative response to a media statement or program through letters, complaints, lawsuits, or legislative action. Flack can be expensive to the media either due to a loss of advertising revenue or the cost of a legal defense or in defense of the media outlet's public image. Flat can be organized by powerful private influence groups, like think tanks. We see this quite often with the ADL and the ACLU, putting out press releases criticizing how those in the media portray certain events, from Tucker Carlson or when mainstream media has guests that are deemed problematic by the enforcers and the establishment. 5. The War on Terror or Anti-Communism Chomsky and Edwards believe that these dominant narratives, or political formulas, to borrow a term from the Italian school of political elite theory, would be the mechanisms to enforce social control and make sure that there was no deviation from the establishment narrative. We see that this has become outdated, as the war on terror now becomes the war on domestic terror, right-wing extremism, climate change, and other existential progressive boogeymen. With a better understanding of how these two works and their primary arguments and conclusions operate, we can now have a better understanding of how the sausage gets made in the world of political and governmental policy, what we know in generalized terms as the culture war. So what does this have to do with the meme, I will not live in the pod, I will not eat the bugs? While our primary methods of communication have changed since the times of Lippmann and Chomsky when they wrote their respective works, a lot of their observations still remain relatively true as to how certain narratives become the dominant discourse in our society overall. The Eat the Bugs meme has become a relatively popular one on the right, especially over the last year and a half as conversations over the Great Reset from the World Economic Forum reinforce the ongoing political battle between nationalism and globalism. There's been a push now for many years, long before the current state of affairs, and we can see it happen before our very eyes, as the narrative is transcended from the war on terror to the war on climate change, so why not eat insects? 
The left looks for a narrative that can unify and motivate, specifically one that is existential, with an adjustable time preference that continuously gets higher and higher. Think of AOC's statements about how we only have years left to save the planet. As Lippmann pointed out, we all live within our own respective echo chambers, and many of us rely on those who know better, allegedly, to push things in a certain direction. This is especially true now as the media is more stratified than ever before, catering exactly to our worldviews with a constant push of managerial and credentialed experts, despite the fact that more studies and scientific papers cite non-replicable studies over replicable ones. Detailing the powers that be, grant funding, NGOs, universities, all of which have an agenda to push. There is no objective data being pushed at all. It is all framed within the narrative of Chomsky and Edwards' propaganda model that details a mechanism of controlling the line of acceptable public discourse on a particular subject. As we've seen now for the last 30 years, climate change has become the growing dominant existential narrative by the press and the political left. From Al Gore's inconvenient truth to the Green New Deal, we can see data, narratives, and policy recommendations being pushed on the public in the name of fighting climate change. For example, NPR in 2019 gave attention to the company Chirps, an insect-based food company that sells crickets like one buys potato chips. The attention of Chirps, of course, focused heavily on climate change, and has the backing of some large names like Forbes magazine, Mark Cuban, and Elle magazine. Even now, the contradictory nature of Eat the Bugs as a meme becomes a policy position pushed onto the public to get them more comfortable with it, as their enemies, right-wingers, nationalists, and other dissidents, are labeled as conspiracy theorists like, as articles like this one from the Daily Beasts, despite the fact that CNN was pushing it long before the pandemic was mainstream news, arguing from a point of greenhouse gas emissions and that they are cheaper and healthier to produce for human consumption. We can see how missing link media, Vox, the Daily Beast, BuzzFeed, and the like, act as enforcers, not for the dominant narrative coming out of the cathedral, as well as the propaganda model still holding up to this day, not just in the way Chomsky and Edwards would want you to believe in terms of the ever-present right-wing boogeyman controlling things from the shadows. So while we meme about not wanting to get in the pod or eat the bugs, note how the ridiculous gets put out there in order to be cultivated and then permeate through the public consciousness. Even more recent subjects like vaccine passports were originally panned by leaders like Trudeau and Johnson, only now to be taken as seriously as the monk takes the gospel. The propaganda model asserts that many of what proponents would call slippery slope argumentation to be their initial ask, only to let the idea soak within the public consciousness by having articles, interviews, questionable studies, polls, and manipulated data pushed onto them by the press, corporate backers, woke capital, and others within the political establishment. All of which reaffirms a long-standing difference between meme communication on the left and meme communication on the right. The right will meme to point out the ridiculous, the hypocritical, and the apparent, as the left memes their ideological truisms into policy, belief, and ritual behavior. We see this every time a right-wing politician talks about the equality of opportunity or how diversity is our strength. Because even though they may be ideologically opposed to these ideas, egalitarianism and diversity, the propaganda model tells us that these ideas are enforced, and deviating from them gets you on the receiving end the flack that Chomsky and Edwards talk about. Being aware of the narrative dissemination and panning what you might think is ridiculous will inevitably become the culture war talking points of tomorrow. So while we continue to meme about a global push for Western and developed world insect consumption, we can at least be armed with the understanding of how such narratives spread, how they are treated and legitimized, and examine the chains in which these narratives are formulated for the proper development of counter-narratives and factuals that may one day help us fight back. The liberal idea of the public good is nothing more than a falsehood of the Enlightenment, as the public good is whatever the concentrated political elite want it to be through manufactured consent. Thanks for watching. Be prudent, everybody. Thank you all for watching. A like and a share would be greatly appreciated. If you have ideas that you want me to cover in a future video, consider being a backer on my subscribe star like these lovely folks on screen. I promise you'll be in great company. Until then, see you all next time.